Hello, everyone. Good, good morning, evening, and, and night here in, in Mexico City. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation to speak in this summit. Um, as, as you heard, my name is Enrique Soto. I'm a medical oncologist. I work in Mexico City. And it's really difficult to speak about any conflict in the world after the talk we just heard. Um, we are all aware that the situation in the Middle East uh, is uh, is terrible and that the amount of violence and the impact of cancer care in that region cannot be compared to anything else going on in the world. Uh, and I'm going to talk about something that is very different and yet also has a lot of impact on the way people uh, deal with cancer and deal with their everyday life. And this is cancer care in fragile settings in Latin America, such as Mexico, which are countries that are not in an open war. So there is no declaration of war. There are no, not, there aren't countries fighting against each other, but rather that has what some people refer to as a soft war, uh, which is um, caused by drug-related violence and other type of crime. This is my uh, Twitter handle, in case you want to follow me or ask me any questions afterwards. So I have uh, no conflicts of interest to disclose. So Latin America is a very complex region. It is rapidly growing uh, economically and in the number of people that live in the region. And it has a mix of countries with varying GDP and human development index. However, most uh, countries in Latin America are low and middle income economies. And uh, we uh, have in Latin America, what is the poorest country in the Western hemisphere, which is Haiti. Uh, Latin America has an increasing life expectancy and this has led to an increase in non-communicable diseases. And currently, Cancer is the number one cause of death in Latin America and the Caribbean, and it's either the number one or the second uh, cause of death across uh, most of the countries. And an important feature of the region is that political instability, so uh, changes in governments, coup d'etats, etc., are uh, common in the region. Corruption is rampant. Drug-related violence is very common in, in many countries. And sadly, uh, Latin America is uh, one of the most violent uh, regions of the world. So how um, what factors contribute to this violence in Latin America? Well, one of the main reasons, of course, is poverty. Uh, some countries in Latin America have a poverty rate about above 50%. And at the same time, those countries uh, which are uh, represented here. This is a map of violence in the region. As you can see, the poorest countries uh, concentrate the largest amount of violence, particularly countries in Central America and Mexico. And one of the reasons why Mexico, although it is a, a, a larger economy and a quite developed country, has so much violence, is because of the drug problem, the drug cartels and drug trafficking, and because of the large influx of guns from the United States. Uh, it's important to tell you that in Mexico, guns are illegal. It's almost impossible to buy a gun in Mexico, but in the US, it's extremely easy. And crossing the border with a gun is not that difficult. So we are flooded with uh, American guns. And that's why the homicide rate in Mexico is particularly high. Um, why did, uh, how did violence or drug-related violence or the current uh, narco wars, as some people have called them, start in Mexico? Well, uh, in the 90s, Mexico surpa surpassed Colombia as the number one supplier of drugs to the U.S. with the fall of the Colombian cartels. And by the 2000s, about 30,000 billion U.S. dollars were generated yearly. The drug cartels in Mexico had an implicit pact with governments up until around 2016, when a change in the administration led to a deployment in the army in various regions of the country under pressure from the US. And this uh, piece that some people have called Pax Narca, in which uh, the government did not mess with the cartels and the cartels did not mess with the government, was broken. 
And as you can see in this graph, this is the number of uh, violent deaths and homicides per 100,000 inhabitants in Mexico. And as you can see, starting in 2006, this went from about 10 per 100,000 population per year to 25 by 2011, when violence perhaps was at, at its largest. Then again, in, in the, the end of the last decade, up to 30 murders per 100,000 inhabitants, which is one of the highest rates in the world. And eight of the most violent cities in the world are uh, currently in Mexico. So what are the effects of this type of violence, this everyday violence on public health? Well, there are some direct uh, effects on public health, of course, drug related problems uh, that can cause damage to health and murders and injuries, which are actually the number one cause of death among young men in Mexico. And there are some indirect aspects of uh, everyday violence. Victimization, of course, people uh, are victims in everyday life and it, this leads to big changes in the way people live their lives. Corruption, uh, countries that have a lot of violence and lawlessness are prone to corruption and corruption uh, affects and permeates in healthcare. And uh, this leads to failed institutions, failed governments, uh, failed healthcare systems, etc. So, uh, what have uh, what data do we have about the effects of everyday life of people? So, in Mexico, according to the last uh, victimization survey that was done by the national government, seventy percent of people um, of the of people live uh, their years with vulnerability and psychological stress. Uh, there is a lot of internal displacement and loss of continuity of care. In some regions of the country, uh, people have to migrate from their towns uh, due to violence or to threats to their business or to their livelihoods. 80% of Mexicans feel unsafe every day, and this leads to changes in everyday activities, including traveling and shopping. In some areas of the country, people have stopped uh, using their cars to travel on the road because they're afraid of being robbed or, or worse. No? So this, of course, leads to problems when you're trying to access healthcare, which may not be available in the place where you live. And this has a severe impact on political decisions, budgeting, and legislative priorities. So when the priority of a country is maintaining safety and uh, injecting a lot of money into the army, the police, et cetera, there is less money to invest in healthcare. Violence is a social determinant of health, and risk factors for violence interact with other social determinants of health that we know impact cancer care. So uh, violence is closely related with a lower education, with unemployment, and with lower household income. And all of this leads is caused and causes interpersonal violence. So this is some sort of like an egg and chicken situation in which we don't know which comes first, but all of this, of course, has impacts on everyday life, on healthcare, and some of these are risk factors both for cancer and for a later presentation of uh, many diseases. Um, what are the direct impacts on, ca on care in general, and particularly on chronic diseases such as cancer? So criminal groups have targeted healthcare personnel. 37% um, of rural physicians feel unsafe at their clinic, and they have left villages and migrated to the cities. And since 2011, at any given time, about 20% of clinics have not been operational in some states, particularly in the Northeast. Um, in Mexico, a large proportion of the rural uh, healthcare provision is done by students, which are in the last year of medical school, so the so-called social service. And these are, in fact, rural doctors. First contact, they do diagnosis, they refer patients to cities. And in many cases, universities have pulled them out of many regions, so they're not sending their students anymore to some regions. And that makes those regions uh, without doctors. And this represents about 30% of Mexico's primary healthcare workforce. So this is a huge problem when, this, when these students are pulled out from villages. What, what uh, have we seen about uh, the effect on cancer detection and reporting? So uh, we published this work uh, several years ago. We looked at breast cancer trends in Mexico and we divided the country by regions and looked at the incidence of breast cancer between about 2002 and 2011. And in most places, the incidence of breast cancer went up according to aging of the population, et cetera. 
Uh, and these are the different regions. So you can see this looks pretty much what you would expect in a country that's going uh, undergoing industrialization. But when we looked at the Northeast, we we saw that starting in about 2007, there was a significant trend downwards that coincided with the fact that in that region, in that time, a significant number of clinics were closed due to violence. So does this mean that people stopped having breast cancer because of violence? Of course not. But this shows the impact of violence, or this may show the impact of violence on cancer reporting, because this reporting is done by primary care physicians. So uh, this was a very interesting thing. And we, we have been doing further analysis on this. And uh, we hope to publish more about this uh, soon. No, so in that in those clinics where twenty percent were closed, and medical students were pulled in two thousand and nine from those states, and so uh, we believe that that was the reason why we got that lump in reporting. Uh, another issue that is very important is a botched institutional response, and this is due to corruption. So. Corruption is a huge problem in low and middle income countries and is one of the reasons why healthcare can be so bad. Uh, healthcare budgets are a, an, an enormous source of embezzlement and a group called Impunidad Zero, which means zero impunity, calculated that in the year 2016 alone, over 300 million US dollars were embezzled from um, the Mexican healthcare system, particularly from a part of the system called Seguro Popular, which no longer exists. Uh, another issue is the stealing of products and goods. Crazy things, including, for example, radiotherapy machines, have been stolen uh, from the healthcare system. There is a lot of bribes in drug procurements. And uh, another issue is counterfeit drugs. So uh, in this graph, you can see all the levels that are affected by corruption. So suppliers, insurers, of course, patient, general population, all of them are victims of corruption, but they are also generators of corruption. And at the same time, uh, both hospital level, government level, everything is involved. So uh, as an anecdote, I can tell you that uh, we, we did a study in a small hospital in the outskirts of Mexico City, and we uh, wanted to improve cancer detection. So we went to the pathologist and we tried to get the pathologist to do things faster, process the results. And we saw that, in fact, one of the reasons why biopsies weren't being processed was that uh, the pathology technician was uh, stealing some of the supplies to take them to the private clinic and charge more money. So uh, corruption can happen at every level, not only at the high level, but also at uh, the micro level. Um, corruption and violence are closely re related. The components of healthcare that are affected by corruption may be the absence of monitoring systems or budgets. There are no rewards for good performance and no punishments for misconduct. And this, of course, leads to more misconduct. Poor salaries in public versus private hospitals, which leads uh, physicians to try to take patients to their uh, private hospitals. And uh, dual practices, absenteeism, and informal payments, which are very common. Another issue is counterfeit drugs. Here I show you a relatively recent study of uh, 596 incidents of substandard medications in 13 Latin American pro countries. And as you can see, this is a highly prevalent problem. Uh, and most of this happens at the final node of the pharmaceutical supply chain. And again, a consequence of corruption. And many of these things are linked to organized crime. And we can see that by the fact that one of the most uh, substandard medications is pain and palliative care medicine, so particularly opioids. And antineoplastics and immunosuppressives are also uh, usually substandard or, fa or falsified. In Mexico, uh, five, six years ago, there was this big scandal about an entire state government that bought counterfeit bevacizumab in millions, millions of dollars of counterfeit bevacizumab. Um, so, and I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for this, uh, but the issue uh, between the difference between conventional wars and soft wars is that in conventional wars, such as the war in Gaza, there is a clear command structure and coordinated military operations. And these wars are fought for territorial control. And the problem with soft wars is that there are no clear armies. So there is no factions. We don't know who's fighting against who. These are civil groups that are fighting amongst each other and that sometimes are heavily armed. Operations are uncoordinated. Uh, territory is not an issue. So they're in, embedded into society. And of course, uh, in contrast with many wars, this has absolutely no rules. It's just criminal activity. 
So how can healthcare systems respond? Uh, we need to improve healthcare, healthcare governance. We need to improve the ability to report and respond, increase stakeholder engagement and legitimacy. So what are, what are the things that can be done or that I believe should be done in, in fragile settings? So first we have to reduce healthcare system fragmentation. A big problem is that people cannot uh, have equity in coverage or interoperability between healthcare systems. So if a clinic that covers you from a specific healthcare system is closed in your village, then you cannot access the other one. You have to travel and it's a problem for people. Uh, we need to improve cancer registration and make sure that we are registering changes in case reporting in violent areas. There is, of course, a need to finance cancer care appropriately through transparent spending, improving the salaries of physicians, and promoting accountability. And finally, we, of course, need to decrease disparities and improve the social determinants of health that lead both to worse cancer outcomes and to violence. How do we do this? Improving access to care in remote rural areas, ensuring the safety of the personnel, and cooperation with local stakeholders. So in summary, violence permits every aspect of life in Mexico and in other Latin American countries. The most affected healthcare segment is primary care. As you heard, I did not mention that cancer centers were affected by this. Cancer centers are mostly located in large urban areas and uh, the drug wars have uh, no impact, no direct impact on the way cancer centers function. And the main issue is that access to care at the provider level can be compromised. And this is a problem that is vastly understudied and has some clear consequences, and we need more information about this. And my final uh, comment, and I think this uh, is important for all of the talks that you're gonna hear today, tomorrow, et cetera, is that corruption and lack of accountability, regardless of where we live, are deadly, and they lead to worse outcomes for everything, including cancer. Uh, and finally, we need to tackle these things, direct effects of violence, victimization, corruption, and the effects violence has on healthcare systems and personnel. And we all have a part to play on this. The medical community, patient advocates, local governments, and of course, global organizations and governments from high-income countries. Thank you very much, and I'm uh, looking forward to your questions.